Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson and our topic today is backyard gardening for food. With us is Andrew Rohrbaugh, a botanist with the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Bureau of Forestry. Hello and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a topic I really care and enjoy. So thank you. Well, you've been with us before, but could you start with telling us about yourself and what you do at DCNR? Um, so I'm actually an ecologist slash botanist with the Bureau of Forestry. Um, and so most folks are aware of our sister bureau, State Parks, because they've been to some of our state parks. But forestry actually has roughly 2.2 million acres of forest land for the public to enjoy. Um, as well as lots of other natural resources to be protected, like species, uh, timber production, and water protection. And we also have jurisdictional authority over native wild plants, which means folks like me get to try to protect them. Well, we appreciate that, because last year you participated in a Learn at Lunchtime program to talk about native plants, and today's topic is a bit of a follow-up on that popular subject. We're going to talk about the use of property to grow foods, not lawns. And this has grown in popularity with many homeowners replacing their grass with edible plants. And I think you've done that yourself, correct? Yeah, I think that um, both backyard gardening and the conservation of native wild plants, uh, they really tie together in ways that folks might not have considered. Um, that's how I view my yard. I've got two and a half acres here. Um, and it's a kind of view or philosophy that I hope to be able to explain to people because I think uh, we all would benefit from, from trying to incorporate that on our property. Well, we appreciate you being with us today. While you begin to share your presentation, I'm going to remind the audience that if anyone has a question about today's topic, please type it into the Q&A and we will get to as many questions as we can after the presentation. So Andrew, if you're ready, then you can begin. Okay, so um, hopefully that's showing up for everyone there. I'm moving a couple things around on my screen. Okay, so I am here to talk to you, obviously, about backyard gardening for food. Um, and like I said, I'm actually going to talk a lot more about how native planting affects backyard gardening and how our backyard gardening can support native plants, because like I said, that's part of my job. So just to kick into it, I'm going to fly through it. As I said, I work for the Bureau of Forestry under DCNR, and part of our uh, jurisdictional authority is to conserve native wild plants like this beautiful orchid here. So what am I doing here? A lot of people are probably thinking native wild plants, you can't eat them. So, so why are you trying to talk about gardening? And second of all, a lot of folks who might know me might be saying, Andrew, you're not an expert gardener. And I would absolutely agree with that. I'm not an expert gardener. Um, I have learned a lot of this by failing and I continue to learn by failing, but hopefully I can provide some tips for backyard gardeners. People can learn from some of my past mistakes. Um, and I will say consistently through all this, um, I'm gonna give some ideas and give some things that have worked for me or things to think about. There are so many resources online to look up nowadays. If you can just kind of Google the right words, that'll get you where you need to go. And finally, um, I, I cannot grow Brussels sprouts. So if someone can please tell me how to do that, that would be tremendously helpful for me as a backyard gardener. So what am I doing here as, as a non-expert in backyard gardener? First of all, I will answer some of those questions. Some food plants are natives. So those are things we can put in our backyard gardens that support both gardening efforts and native plants. Also, native plantings in our yard can help support our ecosystems, as I've talked about before, but also our gardens, as I've found in my yard. Also, using our backyards for food production saves land and resources elsewhere, which will help save native plants elsewhere from being used in agricultural lands. And finally, um, this is a kind of a big picture thing, but I think about it a lot. Gardening is time when you spend outside. And when you're outside, you're by definition, you're in some form of natural environment, even if it's a backyard in a suburb, you know, you're being exposed to nature and people only care about things that they spend time with. And I hope people will care about nature. And I think gardening is part of that. So I'm going to run through all this. I'm going to run through it super fast. Um, I'll have my email at the end if anyone has any questions. 
Um, I'm going to start off by just saying those native plants you can put in your yard, they are delicious. So this is, I'm not a photographer, you'll notice that by many of my pictures here, but this is a picture of a service berry. I have many service berries planted around my yard. Um, I've circled the berries there, it's a terrible picture because I was trying to get a picture of the squirrel in my service berry, um, trying to eat the fruit. But I will recommend service berries all day and all night. I will expound the virtues of service berries. They are delicious. I do not know why other than their likelihood of getting a, a rust fungus sometimes. Um, they are delicious. Um, in some years we have more rust fungus, some years less, but you know we have to fight wildlife for them, which might not sound like a good thing if you're a backyard gardener, you're looking for food, but service berries are one of those things that I actually don't mind sharing with the wildlife because I look out my window from right where I'm sitting right now at my computer and I can see my service berry out there. And I like to bird, I'm not an expert on that either, but I like to see different birds in my yard and I put out bird feeders to attract them as many folks do. And I will tell you this, I do not see cedar wax wings that are pictured on the right there any time of year at my house ever anywhere, unless the service berries are fruiting. And then I will have a flock of a half dozen that just hang around in my yard and eat those service berries. And you know, I get enjoyment out of both eating the service berries and watching the birds eat the service berries. And as you can see, my family and friends, they enjoy and my children enjoy getting into those trees and trying to compete with the wildlife for those berries themselves when they're right. And we, we eat enough for snacking during the season and we also get some for freezing for muffins. So that's one thing of a native plant that you can use for backyard gardening. And my house, when I moved in, it's on the side of a mountain. There's it's surrounded by dry oak woodlands, um, not particularly good for gardening. But you can see the picture on the left. There was just kind of like the cut area in the slope, and it was just kind of scrubby, um, low growing shrubs. So, what I did is I planted blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries, many of which are native species, all along that edge. It's kind of a little bit of like a hedgerow, kind of a, you know, it's, it's a little unkempt. It's a shrubby area, but it leads into the, the wilder areas around my property. And as you can see, after about 10 years, this picture on the right, the children, my ch children and other kids love to snack on the blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, all around the edge of my yard. And here's the hillside that is too steep for me to mow. It's too steep for me to use much of for anything on my property. And once again, I let wild, raspberries and blackberries grow here. And you can see circling that picture, the heads of my children barely poking out as they feast on delicious fruit. So that's some you know, blueberries, as I mentioned, and raspberries and blackberries and service berries, but other species that are native that you can plant in your backyard gardens, pawpaws, hazelnuts, hickories, walnuts, native persimmons and plums. And you might say, wow, that takes a long time but that quote there says it's best. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Some of the pawpaws that I planted on my property about seven or eight years ago are just now starting to come into fruit and they're delicious. And I also wanna mention in terms of native plants for backyard gardening, I don't feel like taking the time or effort to tap maple trees for maple syrup, but let's, let's give that an honorable mention because maple syrup is delicious and it comes from a native plant. So, why am I harping on native plants? Many folks are here to learn about backyard gardens. Well, first of all, hopefully I've told you that some native plants can be absolutely delicious and I highly recommend them. Second of all, let's get into why native plants are important on our landscape. As everyone's learned here, hopefully native plants are the bottom of our food pyramid. So if you lose those native plants, your bottom of your pyramid is gonna be weak and it's not going to support a lot of those animals and critters like the birds and the wildlife that we like to see around our property. As I look out my window right now and I see a hummingbird sitting out my window. More about that later. Um, particularly for those of you like me that like to see birds. You know, if you're listening to me right now, I recommend as soon as you're done, go on YouTube, look up Doug Talney's Bringing Nature Home. He's done a lot of research on the value of native plants to support native insects. And those native insects are crucial for supporting our native bird species. So if you don't have native species on your landscape, you will not, doesn't matter how, many, how much bird seed you put out, you will not be able to support nesting native bird species on your property. 
And of course, those native plants bring other species that we might enjoy see, seeing, like the monarch butterflies, which require milkweed. So if, you're, if your landscape looks like this, with a bunch of non-native species, very, very carefully manicured, and it's a beautiful look. I understand why this is, you know, a lot of people think of this when they think of their backyard or their front yard. They want something that looks like this. But I would recommend to folks that you consider something that looks a little bit more like this. And I'll admit this is a little bit neater than even my landscaping looks like, but look at it as a bunch of different native plant species, which are providing pollinator habitat and seeds for wildlife and all kinds of different um, microhabitats for things to live in. So this is a living landscape and this really isn't. You know, if you wanna support those native birds and, and wildlife, you really need something that looks like this. So once again, bring this back to gardens. Well, here's the thing, native plants actually support those ecosystems, which hopefully you've learned about from my previous talk. But I found at my house, I think that my native plants and ecosystems actually support my garden. You know, a garden's just a simplified ecosystem, but it's not isolated. I mean, as anyone who can tell you when, when you know, groundhog or pest gets into their, your garden and starts eating your food, it's not an isolation. So there are ways that we can actually encourage the ecosystem around us to help out our garden in our backyard. So what am I talking about when I, when I say something like that that's a little bit big picture? First of all, pollination services. If you have native flowers around your house, you're going to bring in pollinators. And those pollinators are going to help out your garden to set fruit, set more fruit, set bigger fruit. And that is what you want as a backyard gardener. So when I moved into my property, you know, not only am I planting a lot, bunch of wildflowers, you can see the top left picture is my front yard. Um, when I moved in, we really didn't have many wildflowers or anything like that. They pretty much just cut down the forest, built the house. Um, so I spent the last, I don't know, 10 years planting a bunch of different wildflower species, a diversity of wildflower species. And it can look a little messy at times, I'll be honest, as you can see from the picture on that right. That's from that corner right by my driveway there. But you see how I have so many more native wildflowers. Those native wildflowers bring in pollinators. They also bring in small wasps, which you might not want to hear that you're bringing in wasps to your yard. But when we first started gardening, I had a heck of a time with tomato hornworms just devastating my tomato plants. Once I started planting all these little wildflowers, I started bringing in braconid wasps. Those braconid wasps sip on the native wildflower nectar and pollen, and then they fly off to find things like the tomato hornworm to parasitize and lay their eggs on. So in the last, I would say, six, seven years, I haven't given a second thought to tomato hornworms because anytime I find one on my tomato plants, it's already been parasitized, as you can see on that bottom left picture, which is not my picture, but you can see that's a dead hornworm. Well, it's still living, but it's parasitized. It will die soon. And all those tiny braconid wasps will hatch, fly to my wildflowers, get a little bit of pollen and nectar, and then seek and destroy more pests in my garden. And you might think, oh, gee, I don't know about wasps. You know, if I plant something like the mountain mint on the left, I'm gonna get a bunch of different wasp species and, and that's not good. First of all, almost none of those wasps are interested in hurting you. But second of all, if you're worried about that, well, my boys saw that black wasp on the right there on that cone flower and, and they kind of were like, oh, it's a big scary wasp, should we kill it? And I said, I, I, I don't know, let's look it up. We looked it up and I am not an entomologist, I'm not an insect expert, but when I looked it up, it turns out that that wasp on the right is actually a wasp parasite. So it actually parasitizes other wasps. So not only have I brought in wasps to attack insects that are hurting my garden, but in case those wasps get out of hand, here's a wasp that helps control other wasps. So you can see how my landscaping and my backyard native plants are helping to protect my garden and also kind of create a cycle where things are controlling pests and being controlled in turn by natural cycles. Right outside my window, as I said, I have this beautiful native uh, honeysuckle vine. It's a native. Uh, we do have some of them. I highly recommend them. But hummingbirds love to feed on them. Hummingbirds then go off to pollinate some of my other species in my garden, like my beans. I've seen them go after pollinating them. But I like to think about the lesson I learned looking out my window here. I used to see aphids all over this native um, honeysuckle at times of year. And I thought, man, I should go wash those off. They kind of 
look unattractive or, you know, maybe it's hurting the plant. Well, it doesn't hurt the plant. And I started noticing as I watched birds like these black throated blue warblers or um, Carolina wrens, particularly year round, would come and they would feast on those aphids. And then guess what? They're flying around my property. Here's a food source for them during one part of the year. And they will fly through my garden and eat aphids off my other plants. So birds can cause damage in your garden, but they can also be a source of pest control. So it's one of those things where it's not, it's not just a negative. If we're inviting some of these natural ecosystem processes into our garden, they can actually help. And this native plant is part of that. And of course, there's all kinds of different things you can bring in here. So, you know, my native landscaping and plantings help bring in frogs and toads and turtles and snakes and dragonflies and spiders. And most of what those things go after are pests that are going to damage my garden plants. So I like to see them around. I will admit that I jump a little bit when I first see a snake. I might even scream a little bit or squeal in a very... Um, very low-pitched, manly uh, scream, um, but uh, yell perhaps, but you know, I like seeing them because they're helping protect my garden. And then of course, if you're planting backyard gardens on areas of your yard that you might not use for something else, I like to think that that is land that we are saving from being developed elsewhere for agriculture. And so some of that land might actually eventually become state parks, you know, just private, private wildland that helps support our native plants and our native ecosystems. So by using up some of the land on our property in that housing area, we're actually helping to protect natural lands elsewhere. So when I talk about all this, here's, here's what I'm showing. This is my house, it's on the side of a mountain. It's dry, it is southwest facing, it is rocky. If you look it up on a soil map, it basically says, don't ever try to grow anything here ever. Um, so when they built my house here, they you know, cut this clearing, as you can see in the middle, and uh, most of it was left wooded, which is good because it really is not good <laughs> for growing or anything like that. So when I moved in, some of those areas around our house have been cleared for lawn and had been mowed. And uh, really, I found that a lot of those areas weren't particularly useful um, for the things that I might like to do in a lawn, like play soccer or catch with my boys. So this is a view out my front yard. There's actually a cliff. I don't think you, you can tell, but just beyond the fence here, there's like a 20 foot cliff, practically real steep hillside. And I thought anytime I play soccer with my boys out there, the ball is gonna go over the edge every, every two minutes and we're gonna have to go down and get it. So, you know, I let that cliff in that area down below become kind of a wild meadow to help support natural ecosystem services there. And I turned that top part of grass into a garden. And there's still a little bit of an area for the kids to run around and play on in the lawn with the swing set. But the rest of it I use for growing some food. And hopefully, you know, that saves up some land someplace else uh, for natural, um, natural habitat. Here's a different picture looking down the other side of my driveway. This is also a very steep hillside. It, it doesn't look that way in these pictures, um, but, but these, are, these are very steep um, hillsides. This one's too short for us to really consider sledding with the boys. It was mowed when I got here. So we put some small little terrace rock walls on it, uh, built first out of wood, but then I replaced them with rock because that is one thing I have a lot of living on the side of a mountain. Um, and uh, turned it into a gardening bed to save land elsewhere. And finally, why, why am I so passionate about all this with, with you know, the, the intertwining of gardening in backyard and native plants? Well, I think that the time I spend out gardening, it's like an excuse for me to get outside. And it gets my family outside, my kids, everyone, because we're doing little things in the garden here and there. And that excuse to get outside gets us out in nature gets us fresh air, gets us a little bit of exercise that we wouldn't otherwise. And, um, you know, I, I think that if you spend time with something, you start caring about it. And even if you're in a, a much tighter suburb, if you're spending time out in nature, you're going to be able to observe things while you're gardening that you wouldn't otherwise. You're going to care about what the weather's like, what that is doing to your, your local ecosystems and your garden. Um, so I just have to say, you know, 
I spent the spring out planting peas earlier and I was able to uh, figure out exactly where a Cooper's hawk was nesting in trees near my house, which I wouldn't have if I didn't have that excuse to be outside gardening in, in the outside where nature is. So on to actual gardening. I should say my, my talk is mostly front yard gardening. So we're going to talk about planning of, of gardening. And I will say this over and over again, please like look things up. There's so much to talk about with, with backyard gardening that I can't even begin to scratch the surface of any topic. So I'm gonna go over like the 10,000 foot view. But when you're thinking about backyard gardening, you start off with the planning process. I say front yard gardening because for me, that's where I get the most sun. I can't garden in my backyard, it's too shady typically. So where did I put my garden beds? I put it in the front yard for the most part. Now, a lot of people will use raised beds. That's the next kind of uh, step you need to take in planning. Are you gonna use raised beds or not? And some of the benefits of raised beds is that they drain a little faster, which means they don't typically you know, flood, which is an issue in the spring. One of the downsides is you do need to make sure you keep them watered then in the summer. Um, but you can have a little bit easier time maybe controlling some of the uh, weeds in the raised beds. And there's a lot of different ways to make them um, you can see the bottom left, I basically just use piles of rocks at my house, uh, but I know someone else who got that block in the center there and uses wood. Um, if you do use wood, I've tried that at my house. They only last for a few years. Um, I'm not sure I would recommend going that route, but um, certainly is a cheap way to start off on a smaller bed and, and learn how to garden. And then you can always expand and go a different route. With planning your garden, take your time and start small. Uh, I did not always follow that advice when I was uh, starting this off. And so I recommend to everyone, but we all decide not to do that. So it's a common mistake starting off too big, starting off with too many things and not really mastering what you're doing. And so you wind up making a lot of mistakes early on and it can be disheartening. I've certainly gone through that. So I would recommend start off small, start off with a few things that you really like and build a little bit every year. When you're going through that process, be organized, map out your garden, map out where you're planting stuff, put out a calendar of where you, when you need to plant stuff out, when you might need to harvest. And that map and that planning process helps you to rotate your crops every year to a little bit different section of the garden. And so that can help with different um, uh, pests and disease issues um, and can help you try to figure out maybe if something went wrong, how you can learn from it the next year and how you might want to expand to a different crop. Of course, when we're talking about rotating crops, soil, 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 soil. Soil is where you are growing your crops. It is the most important thing. It is a whole ecosystem in of itself. You know, it's so complicated. Scientists have a hard time getting, coming to grips with all of the various life forms that are in good living soil. And that's what you want to grow your crops. Um, you can, kind of get by with a little while with kind of bad soil and you know you can do a Penn State of soil uh, a Penn State extension soil test and get some idea of what kind of nutrients you might need to add or how acidic your soil is but you know or even what kind of a clay silt or sand combination your your soil is but in the long term you're going to want to add organic material and you're going to want to try to avoid bringing in weed seeds while you do that. You want a friable soil, kind of a crumbly texture to it with all that organic material, very dark. Um, and to get all that, you're going to need to avoid disturbance whenever you can and avoid leaving your soil bare because that's when it's going to start breaking down and um, returning, losing that organic material and kind of returning to that parent material, which oftentimes in our area is silt, or I'm sorry, is sand or clay which is not always the best material to try to garden it. Like you said, you can get by a few years, I feel like adding just fertilizer, but in the long run, you're gonna need organic material to really improve your soil. And that can be a challenge to try and find. Of course, when you're putting your garden in, a lot of the, there's a lot of debate over whether you should till your garden every year to kind of like, you know, get that fresh earth tilled up and have a fresh seed bed or whether you should mulch and just kind of plant your seeds and try to deal with weeds by, by mulching around. Um, I definitely fall more on the mulching side. Uh, I will kind of till my garden incidentally when I'm digging up potatoes or other root crops, but for the most part, as you can see in the picture here, I put down layers of cardboard 
you know, I got Amazon boxes, I take the tape off and I lay them down flat. And then I put a little bit of uh, mushroom soil or some other form of compost or, or organic material on top to weigh them down. And I found that helps provide a little bit of uh, mulch early in the season, some pathways to walk on. And then as you can see in the right, once that mulch starts to break down, those plants are much larger and they're able to kind of produce their own shady mulch um, to keep out weed seeds for the most part. You're gonna to need to think about protecting your plants. Um, fencing is definitely a, a good go-to for things like rabbits, deer, uh, chickens, and dogs, if you got them in your neighborhood. Um, and if you have a smaller area, even if you have a lower growing fence, that may deter deer, deter deer from entering your garden. Even if it's a low fence, they could easily jump over. Um, some studies have shown smaller areas kind of just keep them out, um, even though they could easily jump in. Um, if you have groundhogs or voles, those can be much trickier to deal with, and, and you know you can think about traps. Um, if you got a lot of pest pressure, or even if you have things like rabbits or stuff like that, you might consider row covers, like pictured on the bottom right here, that can help protect a lot of particularly young plants early in the season. And you know you do have to think about whether you're going to use some kind of pesticides. You know I I don't run a strictly organic operation here at my garden, if I dare call what I do a, an operation. Um, but I use things like Bacillus thuringiensis, which is the BT, which is uh, impacts um, uh, lepidopterans like butterflies and moths when they feed it, uh, feed on it and get it into their gut, it can kill them, which is what I want for things like cabbage loopers. But I do need to worry about things like monarch butterflies. I'm not going to spray those willy nilly. Um, I use mulch, which can invite slugs oftentimes can be kind of a side effect of that. Um, as we've talked about ecosystems, there nothing's ever in a vacuum, it's always kind of a cycle, a process of things impacting other things. So I use iron phosphate pellets, which help fertilize my garden and actually uh, kill slugs, luckily. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things to consider when you're looking at that. And I'm not gonna try and tell anyone what to do or not to do, um, but yeah, there's a lot of research online that you can find. When you're thinking about starting your garden, are you gonna start from seeds? Or are you gonna start from transplants? Or are you gonna start your own transplants from seeds inside? Uh, that'll give you a head start on the season. Um, I've tried a variety of different ways to start seeds. Um, this was an experiment from this year. I had my, my much larger trays on the left that have deeper soil. And I also tried just some old egg cartons with soil in them. And I found that worked for some species like lettuce, like a shallow rooted species, but didn't work for some of the deeper rooted species that I tried it out on like my um, broccoli and, and Brussels sprouts. So think about you know different ways to do that. And you'll notice here, I have it under a grow light with foil surrounding it to help reflect the light back on it. You could do this on a windowsill if you wanted, but I have cats and I found that you know all my seedlings become expensive cat food. Then when you're planting your garden, here's a really key important part. What do you wanna plant? You know, plan that out. And the obvious answer here is what you like to eat. Um, and I would also say add some experimental things because you never know, you know, you might try something that would work out really well. So obviously we like to eat zucchini. Everyone grows too much zucchini. So we plant that in our garden. We are also planting green beans, but when we started having issues with Mexican bean beetles, we stopped growing those for a couple of years and we tried to experiment with uh, yard beans. I pictured on the bottom right there. It turns out we really loved the yard beans. And now after a couple of years break from green beans, we're able to plant those without any pest pressure really. And we can have both. And it turns out that was a really successful experiment. My wife's experiment with okra, not so much. I don't like okra. I don't know why anyone would. If you do, that's great. <laughs> plant okra in your garden, but that was a, a failed experiment here. So you've gotten all your planning out of your way for your garden. And like I said, I know this is just a 10,000 foot view, but let's look at some of those things to think about as the season starts. You've gotten seedlings growing, you've gotten seeds started in your garden, you're planning out things, and you're gonna start in late March or in this year, it seemed like early, early to mid April with those cool season crops, like your, your broccolis, kales, other brassicas, your lettuce, spinach, your leaf, leaf crops, um, peas, all those things that are that are wonderful spring crops. You don't want to start those too late because they will be negatively affected by the summer's heat. Then as the season progresses and you start getting around to now mid-May, we start getting past our frost date, um, which you can look up online. Um, you start thinking about putting out those warm season crops. Hopefully if you've had your calendar, you've started those as seed trans transplants 
a few weeks earlier to a month earlier because you've, you've had that on a calendar, um, which is one thing I do, but that's when you start planning out things like tomato, peppers, eggplants, beans, all your different cucurbits. Um, if you want corn, which I, I have not had much success with in my garden, but you know, I'm, I'm actually gonna try another experiment this year and see if I can fail in a new and different way and learn from that. And then as the season progresses, you're gonna amble through your garden. Uh, this is something that I, I tell people all the time when they talk about gardening, take 15 minutes, a half hour, every couple of nights and go out and walk through your garden and really look at stuff. Do a little bit of weeding, fill up empty spaces with mulch or new plants, you know, look at, look for pests, harvest anything needs harvested because I'll admit the first couple of years I planted a garden. You don't pay attention to it for a week, maybe a week and a half. And all of a sudden you have hours of work backlogged and it's a pain. It gets to be like, oh, I could be doing anything else with this time. Whereas for me, taking 15, 20 minutes in an evening, a half hour in the evening and going out and spending that time in nature, um, it's really enjoyable. It's only when it becomes a huge chunk of time that it kind of becomes a slog and you know you start hurting because you've been like bent over weeding stuff. So that's, that's another tip that I found and, and I hopefully folks can learn from my mistakes. So then in the late season, we, we've gone through the garden, you've eaten all this fresh stuff out of your garden, but you might have extra. Of course, you can always give it away to friends unless it's zucchini. You can never give those away because we all grow too much zucchini. But you look at ways to store the food you've grown. So we dry our beans and dried pepper, hot peppers. Um, we can use a small corner of our, of our basement for a root cellar type arrangement where we try to keep it cool. We put potatoes and our pumpkins and squash back there. Uh, you can freeze a bunch of stuff. We found that we really enjoyed freezing our uh, beets and edamame. If you don't know what edamame is, it's just a fancy word for soybeans. And um, I cannot recommend edamame enough because even my niece, when she went through a picky phase of eating, she could not get enough edamame. And if you can get a four or five-year-old to eat their veggies, um, I, I think it's a winner. Speaking about freezing things, a new experiment we tried this year was taking eggplant. We didn't know how to preserve. We had so much eggplant that year, we couldn't even give it all away. So my wife decided that when she made eggplant parm for dinner one night, she'd just do twice the work. Uh, the mess seemed about the same, to be honest, but more credit to her because she did all the work cooking it. And she would make two pans of eggplant um, parmesan. And we actually froze some of those and we were like, eh, we'll see how this goes. They were delicious this winter. They were my favorite thing to pull out of our um, freezer all winter because not only were they delicious, but they were so easy to just pop in the oven and eat. Um, so you learn things like that every year, even with preserving food and, and, and you know storing it. And of course, canning. My wife does so much work canning. Uh, she really enjoys it. Uh, a ton of credit goes to her for the success of our, our garden, such as it is. Um, like I said, we've had more than our fair share of failures, but uh, all the canning and a lot of the food preservation work, she really enjoys. And um, I can't speak highly enough of her efforts, but you know, when you're looking at canning, there's a lot of resources out there about how to do it, but you're looking at canned tomatoes, sauces, salsas, hot peppers, um, canned green beans. Um, not zucchini though. We've tried that. I don't, I don't know how to preserve zucchini. <laughs> if anyone has any ideas, let me know. Or if you know how to grow Brussels sprouts, oh uh, well, I, I can't master that one either. And then of course, in the late season, you're going you're gonna to take some last walks through your garden. You're going to compost or chop and drop any lat leftover plant material on your garden to help cover that soil. Composting is probably best to help deal with some disease and pest issues. But if you can't, like I said, just, just leaving it to cover the soil is great. Um, that's late season in the fall, and, and, and I shouldn't say late season, but September or whatnot is when you're going to start thinking about planting your garlic actually for the next year. And, um, you know, when you're looking through your garden, you're going to try to mulch uh, your soil to keep that covered over the winter and protect your nutrients, protect that, that ecosystem that lives in your soil and helps your plants. Uh, or you can add a cover crop. Uh, like down here in this bottom left picture, you can see my boys plant putting a, a mulch across one of our garden beds and right above them you can actually see uh, a winter wheat cover crop growing in that bed and that bed looks great this spring and then on the on the right hand picture you can see a uh, hairy vetch is another cover crop that you can plant um, on some of those beds 
So well, I'm, I'm running out of time here. And like I said, I, I know I barely scratched the surface for backyard gardening, um, but I just wanted to leave folks with this. You know, I've done this for 10 years. I have failed so much. Um, and it used to really frustrate me and bother me because you put effort into something, you care about something and you fail. And I've really gotten a lot better at recognizing that my failures are actually, at the very least, even though they're not feeding me, they're feeding my soil. You know, those dead plants uh, that, you know, they're, they're helping that next year of growth by adding organic material. And I've added chickens. I should say my wife has added chickens to our little backyard garden. And we found that, you know, they actually help recycle some of those failures or extra food into, uh, and our yard waste like these leaves into eggs and fertilizer for my garden. So that's one more kind of thing that I've thought about, you know, in terms of a, an ecosystem cycle, a process here where things kind of feedback loop into each other. So that's, that's something I want to leave you with is like, you are going to fail at things. Just accept that, learn from it and be able to look at it in the proper light of, Hey, this is going to help my garden for next year, even though it didn't work this year. So some of our favorite our favorite things to grow in our backyard garden, I've already gone over edamame there. Uh, Scarlet runner beans are incredibly beautiful and grow these huge dry beans. Uh, those yard beans, I think, if you haven't ever seen them, look into them. They're really good as like, you know, fried up sauteed beans. We love garlic, we love cilantro, they make everything better. Uh, beets, like I said, we love freezing them. Um, the Pennsylvania Dutch crookneck uh, squash, I wanted to mention those real quick. You saw those in our root cellar. Um, those are like bulletproof um, um, uh, squash to grow if you want to try squash. We've tried others and those are the ones that seem to like do the best here. And of course, potatoes. You can boil them, you can mash them, you can stick them in a stew. Great, so many different ways. So versatile, so great for calories. So that's about all I have. I'm sorry for running over for everyone. Uh, there's just so much that I'm, I'm so passionate about here with, with backyard gardening and how it ties into our ecosystems. You know, I love going out. I love seeing nature around my house. I love seeing how my garden is impacting nature and being impacted by nature. And so hopefully I've kind of given you some thought um, and I will stop talking now and uh, turn it back over. Oh, you're not done talking. We have questions now. So. <laughs> I know you say you're not a formal expert on the topic, but you have gone through this process of trial and error and learned quite a bit about growing food instead of a log. So thank you for sharing your knowledge, success and failures. I know last year I added mountain mint to, mountain mint to my garden after your presentation, which thankfully came back again this year. <laughs> so after this talk, I'm kind of thinking of service berries and that Pennsylvania Dutch crookneck squash. So hopefully those will be uh, ones that are a little hardy and, and would, would make it. So um, let's get to some questions from our audience. So one is about lawns and finances. So green lawns require weeding and seeding and watering and mowing. Have you noticed a financial savings by removing the green grass lawn and replacing it with plants for food? Um. I am not one of those folks that takes great care of their lawn, much to my neighbor's probably disappointment. Um, so I can't really say that I, it's, it saved me that much um, money in terms of lawn care, because I really don't do much of it. Um, like I said, I, I will admit but, that. I'm but, sorry well, if any of my neighbors <laughs> are listening. <laughs> but for the, gen, for the general person who might be very into the green lawn, you would, yeah. you would estimate that there'd be quite a bit of savings? I was going to say, I'm not sure exactly what people are paying out there to have fertilizer and herbicides applied to their yard, uh, to the, their whole yard. But, you know, I would much rather spend the time and money um, on my garden and my native plants that I can really see a benefit from for, for the nature around my house and for my table, my kitchen table. I appreciate those things a lot more than I do the aesthetic of a green lawn. And I think financially, that's kind of a secondary thought for me, but it might help people's wallet. I, I can't, it's certainly, my wife likes to go to the farmer's market and get fresh veggies and they're expensive. They're really expensive. So growing them ourselves is, I don't know how that exactly lines up, but I know it can't be any more expensive than getting them uh, locally. <laughs> no offense to the local farmers, they're doing their best too. And we support yes. them a lot with the yes. stuff that we fail with like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> there you go. 
There you go. So uh, there's a lot of questions that are going out about what service berries are. Do service berries have another name? Yes, um, there's a, several different common names, but if you're looking to get some, what you're going to look for is the, the genus name Amelanchier, A-M-E-L-A-N-C-H-I-E-R. There's a variety of different species. Um, um, some are actually are pretty rare in our state, but some of them um, have been kind of grown for landscaping and cultivation purposes. So you can, you can find them. I think Juneberry is another common name. Oh, okay. I have heard people, I think it must be a local name. I've heard people say June berries as well. Beautiful uh, white flowers early in the spring too. I mean, absolutely beautiful. So you talked a lot about soil conditions and the importance of getting the soil conditions quite right. So there's a couple of questions. One is about what do you find to be the best soil material to use and then another one was, what was the loam you mentioned in the soil breakdown? Yes, so um, the best thing for soil for me, um, my recommendation to everyone is try, try to keep it covered, try to keep things growing in it as much as possible and try to add organic material. Um, organic material sources can be hard to find good ones. Um, mulch obviously and compost is the best. But you do have to be careful with some mulches. You know, uh, mushroom soil, I mentioned that, but you don't want to actually use too much of it at once because that's actually kind of too much nitrogen for a lot of plants. And you can't just throw on too much mulch, like a bark mulch or something like that, or wood chips, because even though in the long term they really help uh, add organic material, in the short term they're going to tie up a lot of nitrogen for your crops. So it really is, I mean, compost is often kind of the best balance, but it's expensive to get. Um, I have found farmers locally that were trying to get rid of some extra manure, uh, luckily. So I did a lot of shoveling with my trailer um, to get manure. But the downside there is you're bringing in weed seeds with that, um, which I've learned that's a, a mistake that I made. Um, so really, I mean, that that's the number one thing that you can do for your um, soil. What I had here was basically clay, pure clay and rock. Um, and Clay is really good at holding on to water and uh, minerals, but it's awful, awful, you know, texture wise to try to get roots to grow in. Um, so adding organic material helps fluff that up. Um, the loam that I mentioned earlier, um, if you look at, I'm going to try and get to it real quick. Yeah, if you look at that, um, this is the, the soil triangle. Um, and so when you look at this, this is basically saying the parent materials of your soil, how much of them are, are clay, which is a very, very fine material that sticks together, how much is sand, which is a very coarse grain material, obviously, if you've been to the beach, you know that, and how much is silt, which is kind of a mid-range mid uh, size texture. Um, and so kind of the, uh, the loam is, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, um, but the loam is right here. So it's a certain percentage of sand, clay, and silt. And a lot of uh, agriculture takes place in these best, you know, these loamy soils. But you can't always control what you start off with. <laughs> but you can figure out how to work with it, I suppose. And oftentimes adding organic material is the best thing you can do. Well, what equipment do you use in the garden for, for mulching and such? Um, I actually tend to, like I said, I, for mulching around my garden, um, I have, uh, shovels. One of my favorite tools is a little thing called a hori hori knife. Uh, it's almost like a very knife like spade, uh, because you can dig small holes in, into the garden to plant stuff, or you can get under, uh, weed roots and, you know, pry most of those out, or you can cut things off the surface if you need to with the side of it, which is kind of sharp. Um, when I'm, I actually don't use shovels oftentimes in my garden. Um, when I'm digging my potatoes and stuff, I have tried to use a pitchfork in the past. Um, unfortunately, I found that my pitchfork is not strong enough to do that reliably. And I've broken a pitchfork recently, my favorite pitchfork. Um, so I actually am going to be upgrading to a broad fork to dig up my potatoes this year. Um, and but my pitchfork is probably one of my favorite tools around the yard because uh, I found that that helps me to dig mulch really easily 
and mushroom soil and a bunch of other stuff and spread it very easily. Um, and my mom actually tried to use it when I, we were mulching at her house the other week. And she looked at me and she goes, this is why you've used a pitchfork all these years when you're mulching our house? This is so much nicer than a shovel. Why haven't I ever tried this? I was like, I don't know. I've told you guys for years to try a pitchfork. <laughs> so. It's that trial and error, I guess. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that works. Well, we have a question about broccoli pests. Have you had to deal with uh, insect infestation with broccoli? And what's the best way to address that? Far, far, far too many. Um, I love broccoli. My family loves it. My boys love it. And it is one thing that I am still trying to figure out how to reliably grow. It gets hit with so many pests, you know, cabbage loopers, um, those little cabbage white butterflies. That's the primary one that we've dealt with. Um, I have found that that is the one that I will definitely use that Bacillus thuringiensis spray, the BT. Um, this is a little bacteria that attacks uh, butterflies and moths when they ingest it into their system. Um, so I will spray that on my broccoli um, to try to keep down the infestations of cabbage loopers. I have tried row covers early in the season to protect my broccoli from the, the eggs being laid. Um, I've had mixed results with that. Um, and last year I had my first uh, white fly infestation on my broccoli, which I'd never had before. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to, how to cope with them. We always get broccoli at our house. We just never quite get as much as I'd like. I'd really like enough to freeze a ton of broccoli for the winter. We get enough for fresh eating, but not, not nearly as much as we'd like. So that's something that I'm still failing and learning about. Well, that's, it's a part of the process. We're just, we need to get t-shirts made that say that. All right. Um, what do you, or where do you buy plants or, for, or, or seeds to start service berries or scarlet runner beans or yard beans? Where do you source your um, seeds and plants from? Um, it varies a lot. Um, for things like service berries or whatnot, they, they are for sale at a lot of your uh, local nurseries. Um, there, there is starting to become a much more reliable trade in those native plant species that you can find there. Um, you can also look online. There are different nurseries that are catering more and more towards um, native or more permaculture crops. So you can find some of those for sale online and you're, you're going to get, you know, a smaller plant, obviously, to start off, but you can baby it along for a couple of years. Um, and, and they'll grow so long as you kind of keep them alive and keep the, the rabbits off them when they're young or the deer. Um, and in terms of things like seeds, uh, there are so many different uh, places online that you can order seeds. And honestly, for me, uh, Seed Savers is a favorite of mine. Um, there's other uh, places online. I, I'm not picky about where I get them typically. Um, simply because you never you never know in the last couple of years with the pandemic and everyone uh, trying backyard gardening a little bit. Uh, there were definitely, you know, places at times when I was going two, three, four different places to try and get seeds that were still, you know, in stock for different things. Well, we have a couple questions about um, the types of plants. So one is a question about a fussy neighborhood that prefers aesthetically pleasing plants. So is there any type of food plants that would work there? And then also for um, one, somebody who's living in a small pat with a small patio and needs to kind of do container gardening. So what would you recommend for those two people? Hmm. Um, first of all, for the native plantings, um, I would say if you're careful, most of our native plants can be used um, in a little bit more of perhaps that, you know, uh, aesthetic look that most HOAs might be looking for perhaps, or fussy neighbors. Um, you just have to, you know, think about where you're planting these and how you're planting them. Two things that I've discovered in my time using native plants in my garden is um, you need to consider which species are going to spread by rhizomes underground because it's very, easy and quick to go from one plant growing exactly where you want it to, to a tangled um, jungle of different plants. And the other thing that I would tell people to consider is the size and height of the plants. 
Um, so I have planted um, tall goldenrod in different places in my, my yard and landscaping. And in some places that's a good thing. And in some places it was a mistake because not only does it spread by rhizomes and kind of become a little bit more out of control than what probably some people would want, but it's very tall. And some of these tall plants are prone to flopping over, which makes them look messy. Um, you can actually find there are some good resources online for some of this uh, under cues to care. Um, if you're looking up like uh, native landscaping, um, you can find ways that to indicate to your neighbors that maybe this isn't the Japanese barberry or um, butterfly bush that they're used to, but it's something that is a valuable plant that is being cared for. Um, and in terms of container gardening, huh, um, I can't add too much of, for that because I am not very good at container gardening. Um, I have tried and simply because of my own life, my field season is this time of year, I'm always very busy. Uh, I have small children that we're always running around with. I found that containers can be a little bit too finicky for me in terms of watering regularly and keeping them happy. Um, I do grow, I'm not very good at growing herbs either. I'm not very good at growing a lot of things to be honest, but <laughs> I'm not very good at growing herbs. Um, and so those are oftentimes we've had them in the garden. We've tried them in containers and those have not worked well, but I found cilantro. I really like growing in containers um, because they just are amazing for so many different, you know, uh, Mexican dishes, add so much zest to those dishes and I can start them out early they're a cool season plant, so they don't like the heat of summer, so then I can kind of move them around and try and baby them into shade or cooler areas. So that's one thought, but I, I'm not very good with container plants, I'll be honest. <laughs> I'm sure if we talk to you in five years, you will have mastered the container plants. Uh, give give me 10. Out. Give me 10. Let, okay. my, let my children go to college or wherever they're going when they're 18. <laughs> they might have a little bit more time and attention for the, the container plants to baby them along. Well, that is a great transition to our last question, which is what can the kids do to help in the garden? So they're asking for a four-year-old who would like to be involved in a garden. What can they do? Hmm. Uh, that is something that as a parent, um, I can very easily get frustrated when I'm taking my kids into the garden and uh, they're trampling all over my the, the seedlings I've grown for the last four weeks and taking a lot of time to plant out and they just trample through them. So I oftentimes have to take a deep breath and step back. I'm not always very good at that as my wife will attest to and my children will probably attest to. Um, but I found that there's a lot of chores that uh, in the garden, activities in the garden that they actually really enjoy being a part of. You know, um, if we're planting seedlings, I try to just make sure I have some extras. Um, I try to figure out, okay, they like digging. I have two little boys. They love digging holes. So it's like, you know what? I'm going to teach you guys how to space out these holes. And I'm going to give you that instruction. And I'm going to let you go nuts with that. And maybe I don't want them handling the seedlings because they're not quite careful enough with them, but I can let them dig. Uh, you saw the picture I had of them, um, you know, helping spread some of that compost. You know, they're digging in the soil. They love that. My boys, it's a ritual now. Every year we go out when it's tomato and, or potato and sweet potato harvesting time. And uh, I do all the, the hard work of digging the soil and turning it over, which I like the exercise um, for the most part, as much as anyone likes any exercise, but it's good for me. And my boys, it's like a little treasure hunt. You know, they, they sit there and like dig through the soil and pounce on any potatoes they find. Um, and of course, harvesting stuff is always fun for kids. You know, you know, they eat half of what they harvest, but to be honest, yeah. so, so um, those are some of the things that I found. Um, I haven't quite gotten mine into picking cabbage looper stuff off, off broccoli yet, but I try to avoid that myself if I can help it. Yeah, I would stick with your kids on that. I don't think I'd be helping you with that project either. <laughs> so, well, I want to thank our audience today for your questions. If you want to explore more about this topic or other topics related to Pennsylvania, visit the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources or the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. The links are in the chat box along with an email contact for Andrew and some other resources.
Thank you, Andrew, for being a part of this program today. And before we go, would you remind us again why this topic is so important to you? Wow, that's a that's a huge, huge topic. Um, but uh, there's I, I thought about it a, a little bit earlier, and there's an Aldo Leopold quote, which is one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on the land is quite invisible to laymen. And the more and more I've learned about our ecosystems, um, the more and more I see a lot of small issues. And looking at my own backyard, um, I see a way that I can help my local ecosystem function. And I see a way that I can help produce some of my own food. And that kind of, I think I got into growing the food kind of as a, a way to, you know, avoid society maybe, you know, be self-sufficient or self-reliant. But more and more, I see it as playing a role with our society as a whole and that I'm doing some of this on my own to help save land elsewhere. And I'm doing it in a way that helps the, the local ecosystem grow and that I can enjoy watching all those connections between my food and the landscaping and the native plants and, and nature. Um, so that's, I think, why I'm so passionate about it is just being growing and watching those things grow together. That was very well said. Thank you again. We hope that our audience will join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs. Visit our website for program information and to sign up. Today's program was recorded and will be available on the PHMC YouTube page. Goodbye.